The night was moonless and bitterly cold as I steered my rattling old car down the deserted back road. It was a shortcut I'd taken for years, but tonight the wind howled through dead trees with unusual menace. According to local legend, on certain winter nights like this, a phantom highway would appear branching off from this road, leading drivers to their doom. Though I brushed off such tales, a shiver ran through me as I squinted into the dark. Sure enough, my headlights suddenly illuminated a cracked asphalt path I'd never noticed before. A weathered sign read, Ghost Highway, enter at your own peril. An icy chill rippled through me. This must be the haunted road described fearfully by the townsfolk. Those who entered were never heard from again. Clearly, some force or entity lured travelers to their ends down this sinister passage. I hesitated gripped by both unease and morbid curiosity. The phantom road awaited, daring me to uncover its secrets, or sealing my fate. Curiosity won out, and I turned onto the crumbling pavement. My tires rumbled as if passing through a barrier between worlds. Instantly, fog rolled in, obscuring the way ahead. I drove slowly, squinting through the white veil that enveloped the car. The stories of this coast highway echoed in my mind. In Japan, a similar mist-shrouded road allegedly led to the realm of the deed, never allowing any to return to the land of the living. In Ireland, a phantom path was said to carry victims away, to be sacrificed to ancient pagan gods. What horrors awaited down this forsaken route? Glowing shapes began to form in the fog ahead. I gasped as they took the shape of hulking men with distorted faces and hollow eyes. They lurched toward the car, emitting unearthly moans. I swerved around the phantoms, breath racing. More began to stagger out of the darkness, clawing with spectral hands. It was as if the tortured souls of past victims now guarded this road, craving fresh prey. Tires screeching, I barely avoided the ghost's grasp. But escape seemed impossible. No matter how far I drove, the road stretched on endlessly ahead. Panic rose in my chest. I was trapped on this endless haunted highway that delivered all into the arms of horrors. In the rearview mirror, I noticed a vehicle approaching fast behind me. It was a battered old hearse, driven by a tall, shadowy figure in a wide-brimmed hat. The mysterious undertaker pursuing lone travelers to ferry their souls. As it drew closer, I noticed a coffin rattling around in the back, freshly filled. Was it meant for me next? I pushed the gas pedal down hard, speeding away from the sinister hearse. It kept pace, inching ever closer. Up ahead, I could make out a crumbling bridge spanning a churning black river. Passing over it might be my only escape from this nightmare road. I blew past the moaning ghosts and raced towards the bridge, Behind me, the hearse's headlights flared, blinding me for a moment. I swerved back on course, engine roaring as I neared the bridge. Rotting planks whizzed under my tires and I braced for the bumpy passage over the river. But instead, I emerged back into the blinding fog. Somehow the bridge had transported me back to the start of the ghost highway, trapped in an endless loop. The mysterious hearse was gone but the groaning phantoms still surrounded the car, seeking their next victim. Panic surged through me. I was doomed to drive this haunted road eternally until finally the fog spirits claimed me. But I had to fight. Gripping the wheel with white knuckles, I turned the car around back toward the bridge. It was my only hope of escaping this nightmare realm. The ghost's wails grew deafening as I raced back down the road. I would not share their fate. Up ahead, the bridge came into view once more. Flooring the gas pedal, I rocketed toward it faster than before. This time as I crossed the river, I did not slow down. I blasted over the bridge, screaming a defiant cry against the denizens of this haunted road. 
blinding light enveloped me, along with the groans of a thousand lost souls. Suddenly, I was through. The fog vanished, and the smooth pavement of the main highway lay ahead, bathed in moonlight. Glancing back, there was no sign of the phantom bridge or spirits that prowled it. I had escaped the ghost highway's endless loop. Shaken, I drove on through the cold night, grateful to be back in the land of the living. But the haunted road calls still from the edge of town, beckoning the unwary into its eerie embrace. Those who listen and enter face an eternity trapped between worlds, never able to find their way back home. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house, which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I'm a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus. And my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small, basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the universe game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, and she had this mega playlist of songs, so she would put it on ultimate shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question would be the universe's answer, whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out, and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming, before and as they happened. So they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit. But this kept on happening more and more each day. Until one night, we were all playing the game again. And when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch and saw a faded white hand at the switch, just the hand, flicking the switch. It just disappeared, and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out, but I was really just kind of excited by it. For some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So, one night a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town, and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights, just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. It all went smoothly, and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time, and this one night, close to 3am, I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go onto YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up, because I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me, and at the same time the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up, or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, 
but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things, and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool, and I thought I would share. My husband and I met a guy who used to work in our house. In conversation one day, he said, so have you met the ghosts yet? My husband started laughing and said, we sure have. We were a little bit skeptical as to whether we'd imagined the things that happened, but laborers working here have been very unsettled by some events, and in some cases, they've refused to come back. We've always lived in houses where strange things happen, but this one has really been a wild ride. It's very haunted. Noises, floorboards creaking with footsteps, bangs, doors opening, lights and sockets switching on and off, things moving, voices, shadows, it's crazy. He also told us some of the things that happened here. It's a very old house, and in recent years it was a home for addicts with new babies. A lot of serious, horrific trauma happened here. I cried when he told us about it. It's unsurprising to me, therefore, that the energy here is so charged. Knowing this, I thought that over the weekend I might light some candles and sage the house, and invite anything to leave that needs to go, though I suppose some will probably want to stay. I'd be interested to know what you would do here. Our family and friends have said to move out, but we like it here. We don't have any bad experiences, really. We're not frightened. And as far as advice goes, I don't really want any advice on exorcisms or fleeing the house. The worst thing we've ever experienced was a disembodied groaning noise. It was very human and very strange, but if it was intended to frighten us, it didn't. I raised my eyebrows at my husband and then carried on working. Last night, my husband and I opened doors and windows all throughout the house. We started in the cellar and worked our way up through the house. There are 28 rooms or spaces, so it took us ages. I used white sage sticks, tea light candles, and a bowl each to carry the candles in, which were gifts from loved ones and sentimental to us. As we moved through the house, I just talked asking any spirits who didn't respect us or wanted to harm us to leave our house, that this was our home and we wouldn't tolerate it, and that if anybody wished to stay, they could, but they had to respect us and treat us with kindness and we would do the same. In the rooms where we felt the most oppressive energy, one bedroom in particular, I spent a while talking out loud to any spirits trapped here because of the traumatic house history. I said that they were free to move on now, and to go and find their loved ones. Who knows if it did anything, but I felt like we had to try, so I did it with belief and conviction. My husband had a strange interaction in the cellar where the sage was knocked from his hand, but he remained firm and told them that they had to leave and they weren't allowed to touch him. Our cat was avidly watching the house spirit cat as usual and following it around. And then he seemed to be watching and following things with his eyes through the kitchen to the back door. We were just watching, fascinated. I said thank you just in case they were leaving. So we'll see if things get better. We'll see if they seem more peaceful. I certainly slept very well last night. So fingers crossed. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. 
We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly. Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted but I liked to pretend that it wasn't, so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched, noises, and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night, we played video games, and he, in particular, loved to talk to me about his dreams because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid but simultaneously so tired that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. 
After what seemed to be a month, she passed away. And ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100. Stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement. The list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it, until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise? We were puzzled as heck until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much, and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends and roommate especially have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all, and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same co-worker shared another eerie tale. She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening. 
like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps, one saw the pans being thrown by nothing, and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kids stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light and I would get the door. They were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it, when my sister, in a panicked voice, said that she couldn't find the light. I was kind of mad scared, and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall use both of my hands and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done and I would do the same at the top, but we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused because mom should be making dinner right now and dad would be getting home soon or he already was. My other older sisters were never home so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up, thinking that this was just our life now in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then all of a sudden our mom came to the door and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? I'm starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all.
For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later, we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there, but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, hello. No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in just to see the two of us confused. We asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old Western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, 
the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night, and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. Maybe Ed is evil, or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things, and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks. And then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying, and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry. Maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds. That's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. 
all of us still really wonder what in the world he was. My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom, and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read, 
general store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. 
We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell. There was no blood or viscera. And the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moment scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually... I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. 
I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was, unfortunately, all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away, and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up, since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill. Drink some coffee, hang out, and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, help me, right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace and whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. I worked the late shift for this company about six years ago. I would get off at midnight and the company bus would take us home. My neighborhood was the farthest, so I would be brought home last. I should also mention that the road that this happened on has had multiple strange incidents, accidents, murders, ghostly sightings, strange creatures, just a whole lot of weird stuff. On the last part of the journey, there were three of us left on the bus. After the driver confirmed our addresses, we continued. I was at the front of the bus. A young lady in the middle and a guy at the back were the other two passengers. We got to the guy's street and the driver stopped and waited for him to get off. After getting impatient, the driver asked the lady to go check if he was sleeping. She came running back to the front of the bus, crying and praying. We asked her what was wrong, and she said that there was nobody back there, and she wanted to go home right now. The driver switched on the lights and floored it. It gets even creepier. After getting off on my street, I began to walk to my house. This was now at about two o'clock in the morning. Every dog that I would walk past kept staring at something behind me. When I turned to look, there was nothing. There was no shadow, no sound, no body. After getting inside my house, I looked out the window for the next 10 minutes. It was just dead silence and dogs staring at nothing. I've never been able to figure out what happened that night, but it was freaky. middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. 
but I've driven this part a million times, and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work, and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5 p.m. because of the weather. We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant so I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were, and I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot, and it was just 
deserted. Nobody lived there, not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street, and people noticed that every house nearby was shut close. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell, like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new, like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain. My husband's parents live in a tiny town in Alabama. They've lived there a long time. We went to visit them a few years back, and we were excited to get out of town for a bit, see some different scenery. His sister was graduating college, and we were going to celebrate. She is also an avid ghost hunter and believer. So when I told her about some of my experiences, she was excited to take me to some of the haunted locations around town. Cemeteries, old abandoned houses, and even a Hell's Gate, which we didn't actually end up going to, as I told her I had a bad feeling and refused. We drove around almost all night, just looking at different locations and talking about the history of the town. A lot of residual energy and weird feelings as we went to all these different places. We came to a cemetery in a new portion of town. Fancy houses surrounded it on three sides only. On the third side was a small canyon area of land. Nothing really felt off. The cemetery was new and didn't have many headstones yet. It was fenced off with ornate wrought iron fencing. We didn't see anything lurking, no shadows darting from tree to tree or headstone to headstone. It was just there. After walking around to the open side, where there were no houses, I asked his sister, let's call her Beth, how come there were no houses on this one side? She shrugged and said that they had stopped building months ago, even though this was supposed to be a new subdivision. They had purchased all this land and probably needed to figure out a way to build upon it since it was very canyon-like. We decided to get a closer look at the canyon area although we couldn't see much since it was dark, and our only lights were the street lights. We had walked far enough to be outside of what they illuminated. Far off in the distance, I saw what looked like a campfire. I pointed it out, but no one else saw it. Beth began to have a sinking feeling, and before she could say anything, I started getting a massive headache. I heard pounding like drums. I got flashes of images in my head, 
of Native Americans dancing around a big fire. The night sky seemed blacker and darker than it had before. Beth grabbed my arms and said we needed to leave. My husband was already halfway back to the car. As I turned my back to the canyon, it was almost as though I had a twinge of fear run up my spine and a shiver, like I was somewhere we weren't supposed to be. So we ran back to the car. As we drove away, I could feel a black mass following our car as we drove the winding streets back to the main road. It felt big and foreboding, like it was flying behind us. I started to panic and I felt my throat and chest tighten. Once we crossed the main road, it was almost like it couldn't follow us past that point, but I could feel it, watching us as we continued back to his parents' house. I asked Beth if she had seen anything, but she refused to talk about it. None of us slept that night, and my headache didn't subside until morning. I did some research on the area the next day, and found that it was home to the Chickasaw Indian tribe back in the day. I have Blackfoot and Choctaw blood, and later thought that maybe, since I was a neighboring tribe, they didn't want me there. Regardless, we have never spoken of the incident since. This happened when I was little, and I recently remembered it when talking to my parents this weekend about strange things we did as a kid. They told me that this one spoils them to this day, and after talking, I actually have one or two vague memories of it. This story took place when my family and I still lived in a small neighborhood in Alabama. We had moved into a small house that had a backyard, which connected to a small forest. I believe I was six at the time, and my younger brother had just been born. My parents got the house for less than expected, and were excited to start a new life in this quiet neighborhood. The first night at the house, my parents said they heard scratching coming from somewhere in the house. My dad said that he brushed it off as being an animal from the forest nearby, or maybe a mouse, and went back to sleep. It continued for several nights, though, and my dad eventually grew tired of it. One night, he decided to look and see what was causing the scratching noise. He found me kneeling at and scratching the door that led to the basement. He tried talking to me, but I would just continue to scratch. My dad watched me for a minute before I finally stopped scratching and walked back to my room. The next morning, he asked me about why I was up, and according to him, I didn't know what he was talking about. My parents took me to the doctor, and they told them that the most logical cause was that I was having night terrors, since it appeared to occur nightly. My parents accepted this as an answer, for a while. The thing was, I would only have night terrors in that specific house. Whenever we would spend the night at my grandparents' or I would have a sleepover at my friend's house, I never had these night terrors. And then there came one part that I somehow remember. It happened when I was a little older, around 9 or 10. I remember waking up in the hallway where the basement door was. I didn't remember getting up, and I was confused as to how I got there. I remember turning my head to see what looked like an elderly man. He had a kind of yellowish glow to him, and he was staring right at me. I don't remember feeling threatened by him, though. I think I might have fallen asleep again, because the next thing I remember is waking up in the hallway again, but this time it was morning. After the night where I saw the old man, my parents said my night terrors stopped. We moved out of that house several years later, when I was getting ready to go into the third grade. My parents brought up this story because they told me that, recently, one of our old neighbors had done some research on the house. What they found out was that an old man had unalived himself in the basement of that house years before my family had moved in. 
Our neighbor didn't tell them the full story over what led to that, but my parents believe that that might have been the old man that I saw that night. I'm now 20 years old and I'm enrolled in college. Neither I nor my parents have been back to that house since we moved out of it. In a way, I kind of want to visit, just one last time, to see if maybe I could find out about the old man. I'm just really curious about him. Either way, it was an experience I doubt my parents will forget anytime soon. Whispers in the Attic So I've got to tell you about this eerie thing that happened at my place. I've always been a bit skeptical about paranormal stuff, but this incident, well, it was just weird. I live in this old house, and there's an attic that I rarely ever go into. It's just filled with boxes and old furniture. One night, I'm in my room and I start hearing these faint noises. It sounded like whispers coming from above, the attic. Initially, I thought it was just the wind or the house settling, you know, the usual stuff you tell yourself. But the whispers kept getting louder and more distinct. It sounded like a conversation, but I couldn't make out the words. So I muster up some courage, grab a flashlight, and head up to the attic. The moment I pull down the ladder and climb up, the air gets colder. I'm telling you, it was like walking into a freezer. I shine the light around, but there's nothing out of the ordinary, just the stuff that I stored up there. The whispers, though, they're still there. It's like they're coming from the walls. I call out, asking if anyone's there, almost expecting somebody to answer back. But nothing, just more of the whispers. I'm not gonna lie, I was freaked out. I quickly checked if maybe there was a radio or something left on, but nothing. The attic was as silent as a grave, aside from those dang whispers. I headed back down, deciding that some things were just better left alone. But those whispers just didn't stop. For the next few nights, I heard them, always around the same time, always just as unintelligible. I even got a buddy of mine to come over and check it out. He heard them too, so I knew at that point I wasn't going crazy, but we could never find the source. He joked about it being ghosts, but I wasn't too sure if it was just a joke. Eventually, I just couldn't handle the creepiness. I called in a professional to check for any structural issues or animals stuck in the walls. They didn't find anything unusual. The whispers stopped after a while, and I haven't heard them since. It's still a mystery to me. Were they echoes of some past conversation, trapped in the walls? I don't know, and maybe it's better if I don't. But every time I pass by that attic door, I just can't help but listen to see if I hear them again. In 2013, following my amicable divorce from my wife, we both relocated to separate residences. We've remained good friends, largely due to our shared parenthood of our daughter. To ensure fair custody, I rented an appealing house located in the city's historic district. Constructed in 1935, it was well-preserved and offered a perfect home for our three-year-old daughter during her fortnightly stays with me. It was during these visits that I began to notice my daughter conversing with an unseen friend. On one occasion, I discovered her in a tiny closet, deep in conversation with a little girl that she referred to as Betty. Considering her age, I assumed this was a product of her vibrant imagination, particularly as I had no idea where she had heard the name Betty. As a single dad to a little girl, I struggled with some aspects of parenting, particularly tasks like hairstyling. 
While her mother had a knack for it, I was left floundering. One evening, I put her to bed following a bath and remember giving her a quick hairbrush, but that was the extent of my hairstyling capabilities. The following morning, when my daughter was just rising, her mom came to pick her up. She discovered our daughter's hair had been transformed into flawless fringe braids. Initially, she praised me for managing such an intricate hairstyle, but I assured her that I had not, and could not, have done it. When we quizzed our daughter about her braids, she said, Betty did them during the night. Aren't they pretty? This incident prompted me to break my lease, and we moved out within the next month. Betty did not come with us. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as Grandma, and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her, hey, see, it's okay, you can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued Grandma's curiosity prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie. The Vanishing Hitchhiker I have to tell you about this wild experience I had. I've heard urban legends about vanishing hitchhikers, but I never expected to encounter one myself. This happened a few months back when I was driving home late at night from a friend's place. It's a pretty rural area, lots of winding roads with woods on either side. As I'm driving, I see this figure on the side of the road, thumb out, looking for a ride. It's not unusual to see hitchhikers here, but at this hour, it was kind of strange. Anyway, I'm a decent person, so I stopped. It was this young woman, maybe in her early 20s, wearing a white dress, which was odd given that it was pretty chilly outside. She gets into the car and thanks me, saying she just needs to get to the next town over. She's quiet, kind of distant, but I figured she's just tired or scared being alone at night and all. As we drive, I make small talk, but she barely responds. She just keeps looking straight ahead. So then it gets really bizarre. I'm glancing back and forth between the road and her in the mirror, 
you know, just checking if she's okay. At one point, I look back and she's just gone, just vanished, no sign of her. The passenger seat was empty and the car door never opened. I even pulled over to make sure I wasn't losing my mind, but there was no one there. I drove to the next town, completely freaked out. When I got there, I stopped at a diner to calm my nerves and get some coffee. I told a waitress there what happened, and she didn't even bat an eye. She told me a story about a young woman who died on that road years ago in a car accident. She was wearing a white dress, the same as the hitchhiker I picked up. Now, I don't know if it was a ghost or what, but the encounter shook me. Now, whenever I drive that road at night, I can't help but look for her, wondering if she's still out there, trying to get a ride to a home she never reached. I once booked an Airbnb cabin nestled in the mountains of the Gold Coast with a group of friends. This cabin, with a history stretching back 100 to 200 years, was the backdrop for a series of eerie, inexplicable incidents that happened over our weekend stay. From the moment we set foot inside, an uncomfortable vibe permeated the air. The ambience seemed to tinge our moods leaving us feeling unusually drained and edgy. The house was peppered with odd objects that only amplified the unsettling feel. Scissors pinned to walls, antiquated nails and farming tools repurposed as decor, unnerving masks, a heart pierced with nails mounted on the wall, rosary beads and more. The odd occurrences commenced on our first night as two of us lay downstairs, sleep eluding us due to an intense feeling of being watched, we were startled by a resounding crash. The door leading to a small foyer, which in turn led to the living area and rest of the house, had been hit with such a force that it trembled on its hinges. On the following night, as we relaxed on the deck overlooking the forest, we tried to mimic the loud bang to our friends, who had slept through the incident. After we had thumped the wall three times in demonstration, we heard three heavy thuds echoing from the balcony's corner, followed by the eerie sound of a spare chair being dragged. Feeling increasingly unsafe, we opted to consolidate our sleeping arrangements, moving a mattress into a single room so we could stick together. When three of us were in the room, a window slammed shut with a loud bang. In the early hours of the night, as everyone slept soundly, I found myself awake at 3 a.m. I noticed a shadow moving across the same window that had earlier shut so abruptly, and I started recording it. In the video, a white figure entered and exited the frame, which I didn't notice until the next day. It was a clearly visible face, the final and most terrifying event happened just as dawn broke. I woke up to find a man standing at the foot of the bed. He was adorned in traditional indigenous attire, wearing a skirt and sash in red, black, and white, and brandishing a spear. His face was drawn into a severe scowl. In my initial panic, I assumed it was one of the Airbnb owners, and I shook my friend awake. She saw no one, and when I turned to look again, the figure had vanished. Overwhelmed, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I asked my friend to leave the place early with me. Strangely, as soon as we were about a kilometer away from the cabin, I felt my normal self again. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Stories subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. Let's hear what happened. 
So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences, and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short, so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late, and a co-worker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my co-worker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first, I was suspicious of my co-worker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing, and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky. I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second and most recent encounter happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice, but it got a bit crowded, so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes, but when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one happened a while ago. I was visiting my best friend, and we were watching The Conjuring, as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment, her words, not mine, and now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside, even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have, so I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary, even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator 
because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. 
Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically. And then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. Redditor's psychological aunt, 8611, posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter, and there was deep snow. We were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. There was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner, Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night. And it just makes me wonder. This story still gives me chills to this day. When I was in the fifth grade, I had my very first paranormal experience, as well as many of my classmates. Our school was known to be haunted for whatever reason, as well as the high school and the middle school. In 1991, before I was born, there was a tornado, and it was rumored that the bodies were buried all over the city which probably isn't true, but I just thought I'd mention it. I enrolled in the elementary school because I had moved, and my first day was kind of rough. 
I could tell I probably wasn't going to fit in. But I made some great friends toward the end of the school year. We all had our own little friend groups and stayed on separate sides of the playground. But one day, we were all on the playground, and one of the students in my class named Kyle saw a person wandering around in the woods. He told the teacher, but she didn't believe him. So he started telling every one of our classmates, including myself, that he had seen somebody in the woods. Now, our school was surrounded by woods. Sometimes the high schoolers would smoke in the woods, but this wasn't the case. It was only a few minutes after Kyle had told everybody what he saw that the teacher would finally believe him. The look on her face, you could tell she had seen something that wasn't human. You just know that look. We weren't allowed on the playground for a couple of days after that happened for our safety. So we would have recess in the lunchroom. The teachers would bring out board games and snacks at what was supposed to be recess time. Well, during recess time, this girl named Serena walked up to me and asked me if I had seen the person in the woods. I said, no, the teacher was trying to get us all in as fast as she could, so I didn't really have time to look. After that, she sat me down and showed me a locket. I didn't really know why she was showing me a locket, and how it would somehow possibly connect to the conversation until she told me that she knew the person outside and that the person had given her the locket. Serena didn't really have any friends. She was pretty lonely. During recess, she would always sit by the fence, all by herself. A few days after Serena had shown me the locket, we were finally allowed to go outside for recess again. And here comes Serena, walking toward me with the locket in her hand. She told me she was missing the locket for a day or two, but she found it over by the fence with a picture of a girl in it that looked exactly like the person that Kyle saw. Fast forward to a few months later, all of my classmates are participating in a musical at the high school. We all sit behind the curtain, waiting for our turn in the musical. Serena, myself, and some of the others were left behind. And for some reason, there's a staircase behind the curtain that leads up to a door. As we were about to go on stage for our role, we see the same girl going up the staircase, never to be seen again. I was in the same district until 10th grade, and we were constantly on that stage for many more musicals and for theater, and I never saw her again. To this day, I don't really know who she is. I just know that I don't think she was alive anymore. The whole thing with the locket never made sense either. I still have a lot of questions, but it was definitely weird. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin, and now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the army, and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary until White Phase had started. I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long so hopefully you at least enjoy the stories. Whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience one. One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat, so he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340 and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bunks talking about random stuff when out of the blue, one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. Now keep in mind, we're the only ones in the bay, let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about, and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience 2 
The second incident happened one night when I woke up at about one in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience 3 This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about 1 o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around. Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark, the shadow I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience I'll tell you isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy and I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So, are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. When I was 8 to 10 years old in the mid-1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples, and in the back there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area, but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there, so you could see the backs of a few houses a bit of ways through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better. And I watched this robin egg blue shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time, I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were. On the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it and especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window 
stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by, and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg. So I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because, yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details, but I remember all these years later. And I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. Several years ago, when I was 20 years old, I resided in a little apartment. The building was part of a duplex constructed back in the 1950s. My landlord, who was a distant relative, was very well versed in the property's history. One afternoon, after tidying up and doing some laundry, I chose to unwind with a book and a steaming cup of coffee. I nestled into my daybed, as my small apartment left no room for both a couch and a bed. As the coffee brewed, I delved into my hardback special edition book which had broken a spine due to countless readings. This allowed the book to lay flat open when placed down. The final gurgles of the coffee pot pulled me from the story. I left the book open on my daybed and went to get my coffee. As I turned to return to my daybed, there she was. She seemed to be in her twenties, dressed in a long brown skirt paired with a green top. Her style, her clothes, her hair, seemed to be inspired by the late 1930s or the early 40s. She was comfortably seated on my daybed, her legs tucked beneath her, barefoot with her stockings resting nearby. To my surprise, she was engrossed in my book. She lifted her gaze, saw me, offered an impish, somewhat embarrassed grin, like a child caught in mischief, and then vanished into thin air. Stunned, I found myself frozen, my eyes fixated on the spot where she had been. I remained motionless for so long that when I finally snapped out of it, my freshly brewed coffee had gone cold. I hastily called my mom to tell her about it. The apparition was so solid, so realistic. I could not see through her. I initially thought she might have been associated with the property, but the duplex and its environs were built in the 50s, and her attire was definitely from an earlier era. I never saw her again, and I haven't had any other experiences of this sort since then, but the memory of this encounter remains etched in my mind. It wasn't scary or uncomfortable. In fact, I continued to live in that apartment for several more years, and every night, before retiring to bed, I would leave the book open on a new page in my kitchen, just in case she wanted to continue her reading.
When my mother was a little girl, she spent her early years in a remote area of Mexico. No electricity, no running water, and definitely no air conditioning. Due to so many people all living in one small house, it wasn't uncommon for her and a few of her siblings to sleep on the porch. Yes, you heard that right. They slept on pallets outside. She recalls that it was actually much cooler some nights on the porch than it was in the house. The porch had a screen that my grandfather had installed, and he also built their house with his own hands. The closest neighbor was miles away, so from my understanding, the house was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. My mom and three of her other siblings were the lucky ones who got to sleep outside every night. They never had any problems or fears until the night that the baker boy began to come around. He was a small child with golden curls, dressed in white baking attire, wearing a mask that was real pigskin. He would walk in circles around the house, reciting a certain phrase that my mom never really understood because it wasn't in Spanish or English. At first, they were scared, but over time, they grew to appreciate his presence. It was almost as if he was walking around the house to protect them from whatever fate had maybe happened to him. They never knew who he was or if he was even real. They just knew that they all saw him. My grandpa never believed them and assumed that they were making it up so they could come inside the house, but they swore that they weren't. It wasn't until over time, an outline of his path began to show up around the house. Needless to say, they didn't stay in that house much longer and moved before they eventually made it into the States. The strangest part is that before my grandpa died, he told my mom that he had finally seen him the Baker Boy was real. A Dream That Gives Me Chills by user Medical Inevitable 99 posted to r slash ghost stories. About 10 years ago, I had a dream that still gives me chills every time I think about it. Some important backstory. A friend of mine passed away when he was 19 from a sudden illness. His name was Kevin. A few years after he passed, my boyfriend and I moved in with a friend who was Kevin's best friend. We shared a one bedroom apartment and had both of our beds in the same room. Rent is expensive in your early 20s, okay? One night, I was asleep and dreaming. I can't remember the beginning of it, but my dream suddenly changed. It got really bright, and I was walking up a set of stairs leading to an apartment door. I opened the door, and there was Kevin, sitting on the couch in the living room of this brightly lit apartment. I said hi to him and sat down on the other couch facing him. He said hi back, smiling. I started asking him how he was and said that we all missed him. He said he was great and that he missed us too, that he's keeping an eye on us from where he is. Anytime I asked him about where he was, he would say that he can't talk about it or he would have to leave. I said, well, we don't have to talk about it. He said we shouldn't be sad about his sudden passing and to live our lives and be happy, to love one another, things like that. After a couple of minutes, I suddenly woke up. It's the middle of the night. I looked around the room. My boyfriend was snoring away and my roommate was asleep in his bed. I tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I just couldn't shake the feeling that Kevin was somehow still in the room as if something was watching me. The dream just felt way too real. While looking around the room, I said, Kevin? out loud, in almost a whisper. My roommate's head lifted off his pillow suddenly, and he turned around to face me. He said, 
did you just say Kevin? I responded with something like, Oh, yeah, sorry, I just had this strange dream about him. He froze and then said, I just had a dream about him too. I asked him to tell me what happened in his dream. We had the exact same dream at the exact same time. To this day, I get chills every time I think about it. This isn't my story, but it is my parents and two incredibly close family friends who told it. Before I was born, the four of them used to hang out a lot. They would often drive far out into the Mojave Desert, just to party and to drink around a fire and have a good time. For this story, I'm going to call my dad Conrad and my mom Stacy. Their friends, I'll call Brad and Gina. So they drive all the way out into the desert and have a fire. It's summertime and it's hot. Although it's the middle of the night, it's still warm. My mom, Stacy, and her friend Gina were starting to get scared about tarantulas and decided that they didn't want to camp out there after all. So all four of them started driving back. It was like two o'clock in the morning and they were on a dirt road that went for miles and miles with nothing on it. Suddenly, up ahead in the headlights, they saw the silhouette of a man in a long black trench coat with a wide brimmed hat. The collar of his coat was pulled up. He was walking alongside the road, going the same direction that they were driving. My dad grew up hitchhiking a lot, and he used to pick up hitchhikers as well. So my mom knew that my dad would consider stopping and talking to this guy to see if he needed a ride. But they got this terrible feeling about him. My mom always said that just in the way he was walking, the way he looked and how he was dressed, and how he was just out there in the middle of nowhere with nothing, he just emitted this really messed up energy that felt absolutely terrifying and even evil. Gina felt the same way. My dad starts joking, hey, let's pick this guy up. And my mom and Gina immediately start screaming and crying and begging him not to. They were in the back seat. My dad was driving and Brad was in the passenger seat. Gina was even kind of punching my dad in the back, screaming, no, don't stop, don't stop. I guess my dad slowed way down as he passed him though, and they all turned to look at him as they went by. But the moment that they passed him, he was gone. He disappeared into thin air. It's not like there were rocks or trees or anything to hide behind. The weird thing is, I grew up hearing this story from my parents, but living far away from their friends. When I was very young, we moved up north, and they lost touch. Although whenever we would come back to California to visit, we'd always get together with them, and it was like nothing had changed. I moved back to California as an adult, and I work for Gina now. One of our first conversations when I came back was about the hat man. She brought it up, not me. And word for word almost, it was the exact same story that my parents had always told me growing up. To be honest, I've always secretly feared, yet been very intrigued by this entity because of their story. And then so many more stories that I have now read online. I couldn't believe it was such a big phenomenon when I first found it on the internet. Because I was growing up just hearing my parents' story long before the internet even existed. To this day, he fascinates and terrifies me.
Paint by user Jalcott, posted to r slash ask reddit in a comment. I'm a psychiatric nurse. Early in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. There was a resident that I'll call Marion Duchesne. He was an elective mute, which simply means that he didn't, wouldn't, or couldn't talk. But there were no pathological findings as to why. He had spoken earlier in his life and in fact seemed quite normal back then, with the notable exception of being close to seven feet tall. He'd been raised in the deep south and joined the military when he was 19. After boot camp, he was stationed somewhere in the south. One night, he just vanished. It was declared an AWOL for years and finally he was declared missing and then dead. Ten years later, a seven foot tall man walked into a VA hospital emergency room in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, my name is Marion Duchesne and I've been dead for 10 years. Those were the last words he ever spoke. He was covered in dust and he was wearing the same clothes that he had been reported to be wearing the night he vanished. His social security number had not been used and he had no identification on his person. However, they were able to identify him, I guess via fingerprints. He was well fed and in good health, except for his refusal to speak. The family was notified, but they said they had already grieved their lost man and that whomever was claiming to be him simply could not be. They said he was a haint, a malicious ghost of the South and a stand-in for their dead relative and demanded not to be contacted again. Marion paced all day, every day, not in a frantic way, but just lumbering up and down the halls and outside. He smiled all the time and would always be moving his mouth in a way that indicated talking, but he was dead silent. He had this unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open, as if he were laughing heartily, but not even a breath could be heard. If told to go to the dining room for a meal, he would go and eat. But if nobody told him, he just kept pacing, never indicating hunger. If offered a cigarette, he would smoke it in an oddly formal way, almost delicately, if that makes sense. But he never seemed to crave smoking. The man wanted nothing. If I talked to him, he appeared to listen, periodically throwing his head back in that laughter mimicking way of his. There was nothing to do for this man. Various medications were tried, but they did not affect him either positively or negatively. Occupational therapy did nothing because Marion would just grin and unless told to stay put, he would get up and start pacing again. On my last day at that job, on my way to something better, the last thing I saw was Marion pacing in the parking lot, throwing his head back to laugh Later, I wondered if all along I'd been dealing with a ghost. And all these years later, I still don't know. Real experiences I've had while working as a nurse by user actual consequence to 11 posted to r slash ghost stories. In my mid twenties, I worked at a subacute rehab facility. Generally, these places exist to help those who are struggling after an accident, surgery, or something like that, regain their mobility and quality of life with the help of physical therapy and round the clock nursing care. I worked in the dementia unit. These patients were long-term and most ended up living out the rest of their days there. Although it was called the dementia unit, our patients were comprised of those suffering from permanent or long-term brain-related conditions. These included dementia, Alzheimer's, comas, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and brain tumors. These are the experiences that I had while working there. Number one, a disembodied hand. I had just clocked in for the evening and received report from the day shift nurse. 
I was standing at the end of the hallway, with my back against the wall, reviewing the notes I had taken from the previous nurse. Whilst reading over my slip of paper, I felt what could only be described as a hand dragging its fingers horizontally across my abdomen. I jerked back and looked around, but I was completely alone. Number two, the call light symphony. Although I don't have a particular story about call lights, it was very normal to have call lights in empty rooms triggered, even in rooms where the wires that were attached to the call button were unplugged from the wall. Some nights, the nurses would be forced to respond to several phantom calls from empty rooms. Number three, the empty room ghost. At the very end of one of our halls contained a habitually empty room. The heat and air conditioning unit was broken, so patients were never placed there. The nurses and aides would use that room for privacy during personal phone calls, to go to the bathroom in peace, or do whatever else required some seclusion. One evening, I headed into that room's bathroom to touch up my makeup and fix my hair. I left the bathroom door slightly ajar while going about my business. I was putting my hair up in a bun when the bathroom door slammed shut behind me. Mid-heart attack, I spun around and jerked the door back open. The room was empty. The time it would have taken a human to exit the room would have been much longer than what it took me to open the bathroom door. I'd also like to note that there was no furniture in that room, nothing that a human could have hidden behind. I'm convinced it was not a living person who slammed that door. Number four, the last farewell. One patient we had residing in the long-term unit was a middle-aged woman with severe Down syndrome. She was mostly non-verbal, save for a few words that she would utter randomly. She was very sweet and always had a smile on her face. It was my turn to help her eat dinner that night. She didn't have the motor skills to eat properly, so I spoon-fed her while we caught up on cartoons on her TV set. But this particular night, she acted completely out of character. I didn't notice at first because I was engrossed in the show we were watching. I failed to notice her attempts to get my attention. She finally resorted to using grunts to calm me away from the TV screen. When I did finally notice, she seemed overjoyed with something. Her mouth was stretched into a wide grin and she was pointing at an empty corner in the back of her room. I could clearly see the corner, but nothing else. I looked back and forth between her and the corner, but I couldn't understand what she was trying to communicate. She was pointing, giggling, and waving at apparently nothing in the corner. I tried asking her what she was trying to show me with simple yes and no questions that she could nod or shake her head to. I became uneasy with her actions because I knew that she was seeing something that I could not. After I finished up feeding her, I walked back out to the hallway and was immediately approached by a fellow nurse. My stomach sank and I felt queasy when she told me the next door neighbor of the woman I was just feeding had passed away during dinner time. Number five, the window watcher. This is not my story, but it was told to me by a fellow nurse. My friend, let's call her Mary, worked the night shift at the same rehab as I but this story takes place years before I was hired there. Mary was close to one of her patients, and she went out of her way to make her feel special. The patient was an elderly woman with no living family and was chronically lonely. Let's call the patient Emily. When Mary bonded with Emily, it became a habit of Emily's to wait by her room's window, which faced the employee parking lot. So when she saw Mary walking up to the building, she could wave. This became a special occasion for Emily, and the two would wave to one another before and after Mary's shift while she traveled to and from the employee parking lot. Then Emily fell ill and was unable to get out of bed for a while. Every time Mary pulled up for work, she would check to see if Emily was waiting by the window. When she didn't see her, she would know walking in that Emily was still sick. This went on for weeks. Mary would pull into the parking lot hoping to see her sweet patient up and out of bed and waiting patiently to wave to her. But then one day, Mary showed up at work and she did see Emily standing at her window, peering out over the employee parking lot. 
Mary was thrilled and hopped out of her car and gave Emily a gleeful wave. But Emily stood motionless and didn't react to Mary's exuberant greeting. Puzzled, Mary headed into the building, only to quickly find out that Emily had passed away earlier that day. I received a call from my brother with no caller ID or phone company record very soon after he died. It sounded like long distance calls used to sound back when we all had landlines, as if he was very distant. At first I was perplexed, but once I said his name, things cleared up a bit and soon after the call ended. I think his energy was just still strong enough that he had the ability to pop in to let me know he was okay. He's visited many times in other ways. The most concrete was a lucid dream in which he revealed that he was not relieved that his long battle with cancer was over. I have a good vocabulary, but he used terminology that I just would not have. It wouldn't have even been in my mind. So I know it wasn't my own mind trying to work through his death. He was more tethered in the time soon after his death. Now he just pays visits now and then, especially when I'm sick. I know it because sometimes I feel his hand on my forehead, something he always liked me to do for him when he was ill. My kids and I have had a lot of experiences, not just with him. But I'll always remember that phone call right after he died. The moving shadows in the corner. So it was a regular night and I was just lying in bed scrolling through my phone. You know how it is, winding down. My room was dimly lit by my bedside lamp and everything was normal. Then out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something odd. It was like a shadow or more like several shadows, sort of shifting around in the corner of my room. At first, I thought my eyes were just playing tricks on me because it was late and I was tired. But the more I looked, the more I realized these weren't normal shadows. They were moving, like swirling and twisting in a way that didn't make any sense, especially because there was nothing moving in my room to cast them. I sat up, trying to focus, thinking maybe it was a trick of the light or something. But no matter how much I changed the lighting, the shadows kept moving, almost like they had a mind of their own. It was like watching dark smoke move in slow motion, but there was no source for it. I got out of bed feeling a mix of curiosity and a creeping sense of dread. As I moved closer, the shadows seemed to react, moving faster, almost as if they were aware of me. That's when I really got freaked out. I turned on every light in the room, but those shadows in the corner, they just stayed there, unaffected by the light. I didn't sleep much that night. Every time I looked at that corner, the shadows were there, moving and swirling. In the morning, they were gone. I thought maybe it was all just a dream or my imagination, but it happened again on several other nights. I've tried everything, rearranging my room, getting different curtains, even having a friend stay over to see if they saw it too. They didn't, but I still see it. Those weird moving shadows, always out of the corner of my eye. It's gotten to the point where I avoid looking at that corner at night. I don't know what it is, but it definitely has me looking at my room in a whole new way.
The Story That Made Me Believe by user doublechard8733 posted to r slash ghost stories. Can you tell me the story that made you believe in ghosts? Here's my story. I used to work as a bartender on a military base, and one of the most memorable nights was Halloween. We had gone all out with the decorations, including a skeleton perched on a barrel. Whenever somebody passed by it, it would giggle and pretend to pour a bottle down its throat while spouting pirate sayings. One eerie night, as I was closing up the bar all by myself, I switched off the decorations and locked all the doors. Just when I thought everything was in order, a strange sensation made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Startled, I turned around, prompted by the sound of somebody clearing their throat. The skeleton suddenly sprang to life as if somebody had just walked past it. I was perplexed because I knew that I had just turned it off and there was no one else in the bar. I decided to investigate and found the switch in the off position, which left me baffled. Without giving it much thought, I removed the batteries and stashed them in my pocket. While counting down the till, an unsettling feeling of being watched crept over me. Finally done with my tasks, I was ready to leave for home. However, just as I approached the employee exit, I heard the pirate skeleton's laughter once again. Without a second thought, I bolted to my car. Ghosts and the Dying by user McCord, posted to r slash ghost stories. When my dad was dying, he was very much not moving a lot or saying much, and had been like that for days. It was only ourselves in the room, when he suddenly sat up, seemingly quite happy, and started talking to his mother. I asked him if he was okay and what was going on. He told me both of his parents were there, he apparently talked to his deceased sister last, and the next day, he passed away. About four years ago, a relation of mine, an aunt, was dying in the hospital. Her three sons had visited and were staying locally, as their mother wasn't going to last much longer. They were all married and had moved away from their hometown. Unfortunately, overnight, one of the sons actually passed away tragically, it was decided that they would not tell my aunt because she was too near to death as it was. Seconds before my aunt passed away, she looked into the corner of the room quizzically and in a confused tone called out her recently deceased son's name. It was as if she could see him waiting for her but couldn't understand why he was there in spirit rather than in person. The family liked to think that he was waiting for her. I work as a bartender in a quaint town nestled in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia. The establishment I work at is housed in a heritage building, standing proudly on the main street. Over a century old, it opened its doors, I believe, as a hotel in the 1920s, or perhaps even earlier. From the moment I began working there a year ago, whispers of a resident ghost circulated among the staff. My general manager and co-workers would recount their eerie experiences, unexplained events that left a chill in the air. More than once, as we settled the cash register at the end of the night, items that had no reason to fall would spontaneously tumble, startling us. Inconsequential things, like plates with sugar or salt, would suddenly take on a foreboding presence. However, one particular night stands out, an experience so strange that I still grapple with its reality. It was nearing midnight, our official closing time, and the only souls remaining were my general manager, the chef, a line cook, and a friend who awaited my shift's end. 
Given the peacefulness of the evening, I had wrapped up my duties early and decided to step outside for a cigarette. Adjacent to the bar is a liquor store, accessible from the back of our building. A stairway leads down to the back street, and to the right there's a door to a shared storage room, which proves handy if we ever run low on supplies during a busy evening. Only a privileged few, my general manager among them, possess a key to this room. As my cigarette neared its end, I began my ascent up the stairs. Midway, I noticed a hand from within, pulling the back door closed. The light from the room streamed out, and I presumed my general manager had ventured in, perhaps to retrieve something. However, as I entered the bar, there he was, seated as before. Puzzled, I said, I just saw someone slip into the storage room. I thought it was you, but here you are. His casual demeanor shifted in an instant. Rising briskly, we both headed to the storage area. He unlocked the door, disarmed the alarm, and scoured the room. Moments later, he returned, confirming that the room was empty. We often play pranks on each other, but the gravity of my expression assured him that this wasn't one of those times. With a mix of amusement and unease, he said, Well, it seems like you've had your introduction to our resident ghost. Welcome, I guess. The leaves had just started to turn colors, and I found myself driving on a stretch of road in West Milford, New Jersey, known as Clinton Road. My buddy, who was a folklore enthusiast, had filled me in on the tales of the area. A notorious 10-mile stretch, it had more legends associated with it than any other road in the U.S. Stories ranged from ghostly apparitions, strange creatures, to even eerie gatherings of unknown societies. It was near twilight, that perfect hue of orange and purple in the sky, when I started my drive. I remember feeling slightly uneasy as the dense woods on either side of the road appeared to close in on me. As I drove further, the tranquility of the fall season began to be overshadowed by an inexplicable weightiness in the air. In the descending darkness, my headlights caught a glimpse of something by the side of the road, a decrepit looking truck from what seemed like the 60s, parked haphazardly by the side of the road. Being the Good Samaritan, I thought I'd stop and check if someone needed any help. I pulled over a few yards ahead and rolled down my window. There was stillness in the air, except for the faint whispering of the wind through the trees. I called out, Hey, anyone there? Need help? To my surprise, a coin suddenly dropped onto the asphalt beside my car. I picked it up and inspected it. It was old and worn out, dated back to 1965. I recalled one of the legends associated with the road, the ghost of a boy who had died under mysterious circumstances, and if you dropped a coin on a certain bridge, he'd throw it back. Was this the bridge? A shiver ran down my spine. Just then, the old truck's headlights blinked to life, its engine roared and it started moving, backward. The vehicle didn't turn around. Instead, it backed up at an alarming speed, headlights blinding me momentarily. Fumbling for the ignition, I managed to get my car started and I sped away. The old truck seemed to follow for a bit, but its presence faded the farther I got from that spot. Relief washed over me as I saw the sign indicating the end of Clinton Road. But the coin? It sat on my dashboard, a grim reminder that not all legends are mere tales. It took me weeks to muster up the courage to drive by that road again. By daylight, of course. Whenever someone asks me if I believe in ghosts or paranormal activities, I simply show them the coin, a testament 
to that eerie autumn night on Clinton Road. As an ER nurse, I've seen my fair share of strange things during the graveyard shift, but nothing prepared me for the night that I saw the ghost of a young child wandering the halls of our pediatric ward. It started like any other night, busy and chaotic. We had a bad car accident come in, so all hands were on deck in the ER. Once things finally calmed down around 3 a.m., I decided to stretch my legs and grab a coffee upstairs. That's when I saw him. A young boy, no more than six or seven, peeking his head around the corner at the end of the long hall. He had this lost, forlorn look on his face that struck me as odd. Quietly, I called out, Hey there, are you lost? But he didn't respond. He only stared back with sad eyes before disappearing around the corner. I hurried after him, turning the corner only to find the hallway completely empty. A chill went down my spine. There's no way he could have gotten out of there that fast. I searched every room, every nook and cranny of that ward looking for the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. When I told the other nurses what I had seen, they just nodded. It turns out several of them had seen this ghostly boy over the years, always wandering the halls late at night. We now think he's the spirit of a child who passed away here long ago, still drawn to the pediatric ward where he spent his final days. Though the encounter spooked me at first, I now find it kind of comforting to think that he finds some solace in visiting the kids, like he's watching over them, even from beyond. So, if you ever find yourself in the pediatric ward late at night and see a lone boy wandering the halls, don't be afraid. Just know that he's one of our own, and he means no harm. The Ghostly Sentinel of Acadia. Acadia National Park, with its rugged coastline and dense forests, has always held a certain allure for me, especially because of the Native American history. Drawn by the park's nocturnal beauty, I embarked on a nighttime exploration, a decision that led me to an encounter both awe-inspiring and unsettling. The night was clear, full of stars illuminating the sky. The park was serene, its usual daytime bustle, replaced by the quiet sounds of nature. As I walked along the coastal path, the sound of waves crashing against the cliffs was like a soothing backdrop. It was when I reached a particularly secluded cove that I first sensed something odd. A chill ran through the air, distinct from the night's coolness. Standing atop a rocky outcrop, was a figure silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was the form of a man, but his presence felt ancient, otherworldly. He was motionless, gazing out over the ocean, as if in eternal vigil. I stood frozen, watching him. His attire was that of a Native American warrior, with traditional clothing and a feathered headdress. I had heard stories from locals about a ghostly sentinel, rumored to be the spirit of a Native American protector of the land, but I had always dismissed them as mere folklore. As I watched, the figure turned and locked eyes with me. His gaze was piercing, but I felt no malice, only a profound sense of sadness and a fierce sense of guardianship. In that moment, it was as if he was communicating without words, imparting a message of respect and responsibility for the land he once called home. I don't know how long we stood there in that silent communion, but suddenly, as if a spell had been broken, he vanished, leaving no trace behind. The night air returned to its usual temperature and the sound of the waves regained prominence. 
I left the cove deeply affected by the encounter. In my subsequent research, I learned more about the indigenous peoples of the region and their deep connection to the land. The ghostly sentinel of Acadia, whether a figment of the park's storied past or a genuine experience, served as a powerful reminder to me of the history and cultures that predated the national park, a history that demands recognition and respect. I walked away with a deep appreciation for the experience that I had had, and whatever that experience was, I am eternally grateful for it. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree, home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us that are older call it the Monument, as it was that before it was National Parkdom. I was in my early 20s at the time, which was approximately 15 to 16 years ago, and I was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would always make use of the park. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. An empty road, so dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in a red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to the other, was just the kind of vibe we liked. Hours would go by each time as we drove along the desolate road and stopped at various rocks that we liked to climb on. I cannot overstate how desolate it was, how alone we felt. No other cars, no other lights, except the occasional lonely unmanned roadwork sign when warranted. That's exactly what we thought it was at first, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This trip started like every other, except maybe more of us than usual. Crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, gravel was spitting up as we were driving along having a great time. Shortly into the trip, I saw a light, a blue light. Possibly. It was miles and miles ahead. But that's the thing about the dark. Dark like you get out in the desert. The light can shine for miles. I remember saying something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some kind of construction sign left up, I thought. Had to be a sign. The light hadn't moved. We continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. We drank a little, we joked a lot, the norm. Then we piled back in and continued. To be very clear, this light never moved and we'd already been about an hour into our adventure. A question that I kept thinking, though, was why would a sign have a blue light? It's very unusual. But we still figured it was a sign because it was so stationary. As we approached the light, I started to slow down. I slowed more and more as we approached the source. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a car. It wasn't even a UFO. Standing on the side of the road, facing toward us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing, and an old mining helmet. He was holding a pickaxe, period appropriate for a time long before the park was anything other than desert with some lonely mines. His light was giving off this unnatural and bright blue light, his face was blank, but he stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up, and as we drove by faster, his head turned to keep pace with us as we left. His light was visible, unmoving once again, 
facing us the entire trip out. It never flickered. It never moved. He wasn't translucent, but the saying as white as a ghost applied to everything about him other than his clothes, pickaxe, and light. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. It was almost exactly 1 a.m. when we passed. We never saw a car. We never saw a horse. We never saw any way for this old, sickly, pale miner to have gotten into the park. There was no reason for him to be there. Any means of transportation would have been visible if nearby. Worst of all, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there, facing us, for at least an hour and a half, never moving. The eeriest part, by far, was how still he'd been the whole time, waiting, perhaps, to see us. Not once did that light flicker, as if he looked down for a moment or turned his head. He just stood there, staring down a road, at a car full of idiots. Even when we were parked, headlights off and climbing on some rocks while balancing a beer in hand, he stared from miles away into the darkness in our direction. We would have been no more than darkness to any human that far away without our headlights. We never saw him again. However, a few years ago, I decided to check to see if anybody had ever experienced something similar. I found one other story of a couple that saw him almost in the same place that we did, standing there staring down the road late at night. Then I found another story of some people who were camping out in the dark away from the standard campsites, and they saw the silhouette of what they thought was a miner walking by very close to them. I wish we would have stopped. Even if it would have been the most horrifying thing ever, I wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe there was a ghost of a dead miner out in that park. And I would know for sure today. I wouldn't have so many questions. There are plenty of unexplained things that I've encountered in my life. But the visage of the miner still sits fresh to this day. Ghost in the Mirror. So let me tell you about this crazy thing that happened to me. I've always been into spooky stuff, but I never expected to actually experience anything paranormal. It was just a regular night and I was brushing my teeth before bed. I live alone, so imagine my shock when I looked up into the bathroom mirror and saw someone standing behind me. I spun around, but there was no one there. When I looked back at the mirror, the figure was still there, staring right at me. It was this blurry, shadowy figure, kind of like an outline of a person. It was really creepy. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I was just tired or something, but the figure in the mirror didn't go away. It just kept staring, and I swear it felt like it was looking right into my soul. I was freaking out, so I left the bathroom and tried to convince myself that it was just my imagination. But this is the weird part. The next morning, I mentioned it to my neighbor, and she kind of went pale. She told me that the previous tenant of my apartment used to say the same thing, that they saw reflections in the mirror that didn't belong there, and that she'd always written them off. But now that two people had said the same thing, I don't know what to believe, but I can tell you this. I avoid looking into that mirror at all costs, just in case. My Nurse Was a Ghost by Reddit user Lolabunny3000 posted to r slash ghost stories. In 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had just given birth. At this time, I could only have one other person in the room with me my entire stay at the hospital. Of course, my kid's father was there, 
but like the third day, he left to clean up our house and get everything prepared for me and the baby. I had gotten sick and had a C-section, so I had to stay for about four to five days. Well, while he was away, a nurse named Kelly said she would be helping me throughout the day and spending time with me so I didn't feel so lonely while the father was gone. I couldn't really hold my baby due to me being sick and the pain from the C-section, so my nurses would come in every time that it was time to feed the baby. I noticed that when they came in, they never even acknowledged Kelly. She would go to the farthest part of the room and she would tell me, I'm just gonna get out of the way. Now she did tell me that she didn't specialize in what they did. She was just for comfort. So I didn't question anything. The entire day, she was so helpful and encouraging to me. I really believe that I would have broken down if she wasn't there with me. She was such a sweetheart. Well, after about five or six hours, she told me she had to leave and that she would come and visit me before her shift was over to see how I was doing. She hugged me and blew a kiss at my baby and walked out of the room. Later that night, the kid's father came back and he was very upset. He had told me some stuff happened with his mom and that he was sorry he took so long. I was upset, but I told him that a nurse named Kelly had kept me company. As I'm telling him about her, the nurse who was changing my sheets said, who's Kelly? I explained, and she said that nobody named Kelly was in my room or working that day. So I instantly thought about those women who would pretend to be nurses and kidnap children. But my nurse told me I was probably just hallucinating, and she told my doctor. I talked to my doctor, and he said the same thing. Well, a couple of hours later, a nurse that I didn't recognize came into my room and said, I know this might sound crazy, but everyone on the floor is talking about you seeing Kelly. I said, yeah, she was in here with me for like seven hours today. She helped out a lot. We're smiling and laughing while I'm telling her about Kelly and how sweet and funny she was. Then she pulled up her phone and showed me pictures of her and Kelly that looked to be maybe early 2000s. I was smiling because clearly I wasn't hallucinating. Then she sat down and told me that Kelly had died over 10 years prior from DV with her boyfriend. I wasn't too shocked because my entire life I've been dealing with the paranormal but I got chills because I never had an encounter this deep. The lady gave me a hug and started crying and said, now I know Kelly's okay. Since that day, I've always wondered why Kelly came into my room to help me. I kind of wish I could see her again. I am not new to the paranormal, and strange things happen to me from time to time. I'm an empath, so I think that makes me more open than most. My earliest experience that I can remember took place when I was about 10 years old. A bit of backstory. When I was eight years old, we moved from Cheshire, England to Secunda in South Africa. It was during the time of apartheid in South Africa in the early 80s. The way of life there was very different to what I had grown up with in rural England. My dad had always wanted to live in the sunshine and he landed a job at Sassel. The company he was working for in Cheshire was laying people off at an ever increasing pace, as were many other local factories, and I think he was worried about being next. We had been living in Secunda for two years when we moved to Van Nykirk Street a lovely big house that my mother fell in love with. It was the first house we had owned since moving to South Africa. So we packed our meager belongings collected over the last two years and moved from the smaller house Sassel had provided us closer to the center of town. We had a lovely lady who was our nanny and maid named Julie. She had started to work for us about two weeks after we arrived in South Africa and she stayed with us for many years. In those days, it was normal to have help in the house. The houses even came with small bedrooms and a toilet in the back garden, known as a kaya. 
These rooms were not connected to the main house, so the worker could come and go and have privacy. Many of the local house workers lived in the more rural areas, so they lived in town during the week. Julie moved with us to the new house. She was also thrilled at the move, as her room at the new house was bigger and had a bath with a shower. Julie at this point had worked for us for a few years and took care of myself and my little sister while my mother worked full time at a local hotel. Julie was Zulu. The Zulu tribe are a very superstitious people and to this day make use of a sangoma or a witch doctor to cure illnesses and curse people, paying the sangoma for the privilege. Julie used to tell my sister and I about the bad spirits she believed in and the stories of the tokoloshi, the evil dwarf devil that used to climb onto young women's beds and have his way with them, making them have kids and then leaving them to raise the spawn. Lovely. To prevent herself from becoming a victim to this creature, she had her bed up on bricks so that he couldn't climb onto it. Most young women of childbearing age did this, at least if they believed in this thing. One morning, she walked into the kitchen looking very shaken. My mother sat her down and gave her a mug of sweet tea and asked her what was wrong. She blurted out that she had had no sleep that night and that evil spirits were haunting this house. My mother pressed her, and once she had calmed down, she told my mother the story. The previous night, before bed, she was writing a letter to her family by candlelight. Julie always had candles burning, and my mother was very conscious that one day she would burn down the kaya. While she was writing, her candle went out. She assumed it was a breeze, so she got up and put a spare blanket across the bottom of the door. The kaya did not have any windows, and it was made of solid breeze block. So the crack under the door would be the only source for the breeze. She decided to leave the big light on to finish her letter. It was then that she was startled by the flushing of the toilet. It just flushed all by itself. She didn't dare go into the bathroom, but apparently the toilet flushed at least twice an hour all night until about 6 a.m. when it finally stopped. My mother said she would call a plumber to look at the toilet, told Julie to take the day off and just sleep. Julie went off to the neighbor's maid's kaya, as she did not want to go back to sleep in her own bed. My mother had an emergency plumber out later that day, who said there was absolutely nothing wrong with the toilet. He said he had no clue how it was even possible that it had flushed by itself. Over the next few days, Julie calmed down enough to move back to her room. The toilet still flushed, and now and then the taps on the bath would turn on by themselves. My mother told Julie that it was probably a plumbing issue, and that it wasn't an ancestor or an angry or evil spirit. All was calm until Julie woke up one morning to find her room wrecked. Her clothes were scattered around, ornaments broken. She had slept through all of it. At first, she suspected her room had been broken into while she slept. But when she went to the door, it was still locked and bolted from the inside. Julie refused to stay there after that and moved a few things into her friend's kaya next door. About a week later, a large crack appeared in the wall of the main house. My father was concerned that the house would fall on us with the speed that it appeared and called the surveyor to come out and take a look. He determined that the foundations of the house were faulty and that they needed to be stabilized. Basically, a trench was to be dug all the way around the house and concrete poured in to reinforce the house. The work was urgent, so it started the following week. This was when things started to happen in the main house. Shoes would go missing and appear outside, in a trench, as would keys. The fridge blew up, followed closely by the washing machine. Our two dogs would bark at thin air, the hairs on their backs up. The toilet in the main house started flushing by itself too. It was then that my dad joked that we had a ghost with the runs. We heard voices in the garden and would go outside and see nothing. As the trenches were dug deeper, the reason for all the problems came to light. Out of the holes, the workers hauled broken bits of headstone 
and human bones. In fear, the workers refused to dig more and left the site. The headstones that were pulled up were shiny, smashed, large pieces of marble, not pitted as you would expect them to look having been underground for a while. I personally don't remember there being any writing on them. I remember thinking that they would have been great for tap dancing on until my mother caught me and told me off. The police were called and our house was officially declared a crime scene. The bones were taken away to be tested. The local press heard about the story and it made the front page of the local paper. My sister and I, posing with a large piece of the gravestone near the trenches, graced the covers. The police sent a team to dig up the rest of the garden and locate all that they could. My mother told me that they found pieces of several skeletons. About a month later, we were given the all clear to fill in the foundation trenches and all the gravestones and all of the bones were taken away by the council. The local police chief told us that Secunda was built over three farms. It was built by the factory for the employees. In those days, farms had family burial plots on them, and the generations of the families who ran the farm were buried there. When the farms were purchased, they apparently collected up all the graves and buried them in one hole. Our house was built on top of it. The police assured us that the remains they collected were relocated to consecrated ground and buried with respect, and that headstones stating the family names of the original owners of the farms would be put there. After that, the strange happening stopped. I hope those souls found rest in the end. We stayed in the house another year after that, but Julie never did come back to the house. Instead, she left and started her own business with the help of my mother. When we moved, she came back to live with us again, her bed still on bricks. Entities in the house. I lived in the house where all of this took place from the ages of 9 to 23. My parents got divorced when I was 14. I lived with my parents, younger brother, and grandma. My younger brother was the first to notice something strange in the house. One night in 2005, he woke us up at about 11 p.m., crying, saying that there was someone outside his window. Living in South Africa, such things are possible, so my dad went to inspect and found nothing. A few weeks later, my aunt, my mom's sister, came to visit from out of town and was sleeping in my grandma's room. She relayed to us the next morning that she was awoken by the door opening and a figure staring at her from around the corner. Fast forward a few years to 2007 and 2008. I would normally stay alone at home whenever my dad would go out fishing with my brother for the weekend. This is when I started noticing odd things happening. Keys would go missing. Lights would be on after I know I had switched them off. Small things, but significant enough for me to take note. 2010 is when things got real. I was in my last year of high school and working part-time for my dad who has an office on the same property as the house. I was working on a file, left it on the desk and went to lunch. And when I returned, the file was gone. No one else could have taken it as the only other staff member was the receptionist. About a week later, we found the file one morning just laying in the middle of the floor. That weekend, a friend of mine stayed over in my brother's room and we came home from a party. It must have been about one or two in the morning when we got to bed. I was already falling asleep when I heard him scream for me. My room and my brother's room share a bathroom with doors on each side. I get to my friend who is literally sweating and I asked him what happened. He said somebody started to choke him as soon as he closed his eyes to sleep, but nobody visible was there. From that day, I would be seeing the man, as we named him, around the property. I've seen him while working on my car in the garage. 
I've seen him while doing dishes. My father has even seen him while sitting in the garden. I never see his face, but he's always wearing blue overalls, like the ones construction workers wear. It wasn't serious until I got married and had a kid. This takes us to October of 2019. My son is a year and a half old and he refuses to be in this house. He cries constantly whenever we visit my dad. And as soon as we leave, he's perfectly well behaved. Two weekends ago, my dad had gone out fishing. My brother wasn't around. I had to come feed the cats and switch on the lights. I came in at about 7 p.m. that Saturday night, and as soon as I walked into the house, I felt a chill. Thinking nothing about it, I carried on with what I had to do. While in the kitchen, I heard heavy footsteps in the lounge and the breaking of glass. I rushed to investigate, and I found a vase that's normally on the cabinet about five meters away, on the floor, in pieces. I locked up and got out of there. I told my wife the story when I got home, and she suggested that I burn frankincense around the house and read some prayers. Sunday morning, I set out on my mission, and I started burning frankincense and praying around the house. When I got to the office, I had just begun to pray when the glass sliding door shattered. Since then, my son hasn't been fussing when he comes here, and the atmosphere seems a lot lighter around the house. I'm a game ranger in South Africa, Mpumalanga, 80 kilometers away from the nearest town, in the dense bush. I was off duty that night. The night it all happened, and I went to bed early. My room was surrounded by an electric fence, so any harmful animal wouldn't easily get to me, unless it happened to break through the fence. The area around the rooms are usually fairly safe to walk around if you keep your wits about you. I woke up at about one o'clock in the morning to a pup growling at my window. I had a feeling like I was being watched, so I just stayed still and quiet for about five minutes. I couldn't figure out why my pup was growling. Then I heard it, directly outside my bedroom window, were quick, short footsteps and what sounded like children whispering. Thinking it was some of the other staff finishing a shift late and walking past my room or pulling a prank, I told them to shut up, and they did. Or it did. But then the whispers carried on, this time closer to my window. My puppy started whining and growling and trying to climb underneath my duvet. I grabbed my 303 rifle because things in South Africa are unstable with violence, so it's never a bad thing to carry. I mustered up the courage to yell at these jerks playing a prank outside my window. I quickly opened the blinds to catch them off guard but I didn't see any people or any animals for that matter. But I did see something short, entirely black and faceless. A figure that immediately ran away at an unnatural pace. Each step was like a three meter glide to the next. The hair on my neck stood right up and tears started to well up. By now, my puppy was aggressively barking at the front glass door to where this thing ran and started howling. I had no idea what had just happened, and I wasn't about to be a sitting duck. So I went outside with my 303 and searched the immediate area outside my window. There was nothing. No footprints, no dark figure, just nothing. But the next day, I did find random bird feathers bunched up with some twigs with what looked like hair under the tree outside my window. I spoke with one staff member, an African guy who I got along with the most, and I explained what happened. Turns out the locals that night stayed indoors because they knew it was the night where the witch doctors were calling out demons to do their deeds. 
this particular one was sent to whisper black tongues outside of my window, whatever that is, for who knows what. Apparently it's some kind of spell to get me to leave the area. My buddy told me that I was lucky it ran away and didn't attack me when I went outside. I guess what was supposed to happen was that the thing was supposed to light a fire of the feathers and twigs and hair, and that would be their sacrifice kind of thing for their spell. Who knows? And somehow I interrupted it. I never did validate any of this, it was just what I was told. I said, thanks for that information, I feel so much better. There's a lot more weird things that happened to me out there, but that one was definitely the scariest. The Demon House, submitted by subscriber Freddy. You can call me Freddy. I'm from a small town in South Carolina, and I've been dealing with the paranormal all my life. I'm 28 years old, and I've always been a believer in things like ghosts, spirits, and demons, even vampires and werewolves. I've had many paranormal encounters. My dad said I was born with a veil over my face. It took me a long time to learn how to control it. For years, I would cry and lose sleep over the encounters I would have. And it didn't help that my mom never believed me. But with years of practice, I learned how to keep them away, especially the evil ones, because they seemed especially attracted to me. My first encounter, I think I was about nine or 10 years old, and I was laying in bed asleep one night. All of a sudden, I was awake. I felt like somebody was standing over me. At first I thought it was my dad because he would always come and check on me. I looked to the side and I saw a tall dark figure standing over my bed. I don't know how I know, but it was looking at me. I couldn't see any facial detail, but the energy I felt coming from it was very masculine. I quickly realized it wasn't my dad because he was short and thick. Whoever this was, was tall and skinny. I was so scared, but something told me to just lay still and don't move. So I laid there for what felt like hours until finally my dad turned my lights on. I told him what I saw and he stayed with me until I went back to sleep. From then on, things didn't get any better. For years, I would experience sleep paralysis, noises. I would be scratched, I'd wake up with bruises. Not all the spirits I encountered were bad. Sometimes I would wake up at night crying about my baby, about how I couldn't find her and someone took her from me. I know I probably sounded crazy because I was 13 and I didn't have a baby. Also, I remember one time I was depressed and I was at my aunt's house alone. I was praying to God, asking him to give me a sign that someone loved me. And all of a sudden, one of my aunt's angel figurines fell, and the front door flew open. Most of the activity that happened to me happened in a trailer that my family owned. I never looked up the history of the land or anything, but I hated that trailer. I was literally tortured there. I was a 15 to 16 year old kid whose dad still had to stay with her until she fell asleep because I was so scared. I was pretty sure that house had a demon in it, but I never saw it, but I felt it. For some reason, it seemed like it was attached to me. I could feel it. I knew that it wanted to hurt me. My mom never believed me. She just thought I was crazy. That was until she sold it. The lady that bought it was trying to fix it up, but she just kept having bad luck with it. Eventually, she decided to sell it, and she called my mom and offered to let her buy it back. My mom told her that she wouldn't be interested in buying it back, but she did ask why she wanted to sell it since she'd only had it for a few months. The lady told my mom that something evil lives in that house and she wanted it out of her life as soon as possible before something bad happened to her. I guess then she realized I wasn't running to her room every night terrified to sleep on the floor at 17 for fun.
Our next story comes from Moonfire. I have so many, but I'll submit my experiences one at a time. I'll start with the basement apartment in 1992. I hate it when landlords or realtors don't tell you that a place is haunted. For five months too long, I stayed at a seemingly nondescript apartment in Nampa, Idaho. Less than a month in, I had my first encounter with my dead roommate. He appeared hovering over me in bed and woke me up. His form was a long, stretched out black, cloudy, swirling mass. He had no face and a skinny little head. He looked down at me a couple of times as though scanning me. Then I found my voice and screamed at it to get out. He flew away backwards into the wall and disappeared. Three weeks later, he came back. I felt an angry presence in the room and slept on the couch instead. The next night, I returned to my room. I was awakened later by someone sitting down on the bed, staring at me. My feet even rolled into his form. I was terrified, but too afraid to move. Then I realized he could do something to me if I didn't wake up. I wiggled my toe and woke up. He was gone. And about a month later, I was too. I found out from the landlord that there was a guy in there that had himself before I moved in. Seems like he never quite left. So a little backstory. I went to a special needs school for nine years one of the Tivin schools in Denmark. The buildings are over 130 years old, and they have a lot of history, including being a tuberculosis treatment center. The basement was where all the creative things were, like paint and stonecutter tools, the library, and some other things. At the time, I was 13 to 14. I'm female. I was also very creative, and I loved to go down there after school because I could just hide in there and be myself and make things. To get there, you'd have to walk through a very loud door, go left just a little bit, and then go through another door, a glass door, and then finally the last door. You could always, always hear it when somebody was coming down there because it was just so loud. The person who was supposed to be taking care of me left and I was alone in the basement in that room. I heard the door and everything and them walking up the stairs. Then I heard a whisper. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was definitely a woman. The person who was taking care of me was a man, so it wasn't him. I looked to where I had heard the whisper, and this is where I saw a transparent woman in old fashioned clothing from what I could tell, it seemed like something was running down her face. When I think about it now, maybe it was blood, but it was pretty dark. We made eye contact. Surprisingly, I wasn't scared. I didn't really think about it. It was normal to see things down there, to hear things. I asked if she was okay, and she screamed in a way that I can't describe. Honestly, it was like a banshee. And then she just disappeared. The weird thing is, my stepdad's father passed away a little over a week later. To this day, I can't be totally sure what I saw down there. I know banshees aren't from Denmark, but that scream. It was odd and different. It wasn't like a normal scream. And them being harbingers of doom and all that, and then something bad happening later. I don't know. I'm 21 now, and I'm still as confused as I was back then. All I know is that that school was definitely haunted, because I'm not the only one who saw some things there.
During my childhood, I had family who lived in Saudi Daisy, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. One of them told me a story of how, as a girl in the 1930s, she had seen the famed Black Track Ghost. When I asked her about it, she told me the story. In the early part of the last century, a beautiful young lady was forced to choose between the pampered life of a well-to-do daughter in Chattanooga and the dirty, boring life at a Saudi Daisy coal mine. She is known as a Black Track Ghost, which is so named based on the scattered coal that's found over the train tracks in the area of the mines. The young lady, who was the daughter of a local Chattanooga doctor, decided to marry a handsome clerk at the Saudi Daisy Mining Office. Outraged at the mismatch, the irate doctor disinherited his headstrong daughter. After a few weeks of marriage, though, the young bride apparently grew bored with life with her shantytown clerk and was instead attracted to a rough-and-tumble miner. One night, the mining office was robbed and the clerk was brutally murdered. The unfaithful bride and her miner disappeared and weren't heard from again, at least not in the usual sense. Sometime later, the body of a young, unidentified woman was discovered in a lake in an adjacent county, apparently the victim of murder herself. No connection was ever made to the runaway bride until her image began to plague the Saudi Daisy miners. The first encounter was reported by a hardened coal miner walking home on a bitterly cold winter's night. As the crippled man struggled up the deserted street, he became aware of somebody quickly approaching him on his right. His silent companion, with hair dripping wet and dressed only in a thin white slip, glided past him. Even though he recognized the specter, she stepped by without acknowledging him. The miner was mesmerized, noting that his breath was like a fog in the cold, dark night, while her rigid lips emitted nothing. The black track ghost visits became a common occurrence in Saudi Daisy. When she wore a long, flowing white gown, local residents believed she was just wandering. But... If she appeared in her gray slip, which was apparently her death shroud, she foretold doom. If she stood outside somebody's window, a fatal tragedy would befall the unfortunate homeowner. Although the black track ghost is best known in Saudi Daisy, her spirit continued to echo her desire to exist in two worlds. Her father's home was near Walden's, the old Civil War hospital, located near East 8th Street and what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. The friend that I knew said that she lived in that area as a little girl. The child witnessed the black track ghost many times as she stood and looked sadly into a nearby doctor's home. When the little girl spoke of it, she was slapped and told not to tell lies, but she said that she was only telling the truth. She was just observing the sad shade of a woman who was visiting the comfort and luxury of her father's domain with the knowledge that she could never return home again. Another haunting that went hand in hand with this and occurred simultaneously happened to those living near the coal mining town. They experienced something unique. A pair of glowing eyes would appear in several of the local houses on a fairly regular basis. After a while, nobody was even alarmed it just became accepted. A young bride got the life scared out of her after waking up to see the ghost roaming her bedroom. Folks just laughed like it was nothing out of the norm. The haunting stopped sometime around the mid fifties though, and nobody's heard from the ghost since, and nobody really knows why. Last January, I was between jobs, and I had just recently had a daughter, who was at the time about five months old. My husband had been working through my pregnancy, but lost his job. We were living at my mom's house, 
I have an education in psychology and some experience as a counselor, so I was looking for the best I could get. But the best I could find right away was a job working as a paraprofessional in the special education department of an elementary school in a nearby suburb. The position was unique to the virus times, being that they needed someone to just sit around in the computer room while the kiddos did speech therapy over Zoom. Don't get me started on how terrible virtual speech therapy is. But anyway, my job was to just walk around the school back and forth between classrooms and the computer room, picking up kids, taking them to the Zoom room, sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour depending on the kid, taking them back, Picking up the next batch, I was overqualified, we'll say. Some days of the week were scheduled tightly, and other days of the week, I routinely had just two appointments. The school was a ginormous horseshoe shape, housing 700 elementary school children. I was located all the way at the far back on one side of the pre-K wing. It could take 15 minutes to walk all the way across the building and back when the kids I was picking up were in the older grades. Every day I would make this walk. In the middle of the school, across from the front office, I would always notice, and try to ignore, this strange rag doll with construction paper over its face, showcased in a display case. No bad vibes from it, but it just seemed out of place and random. It was there the entire five months that I worked there, never changing or having anything added to the case. Onward. Well, weird things happened in the computer room where I worked. The doors in the school use a key to lock from both the inside and outside. The doors do not lock automatically. You absolutely 100% have to manually lock them with a key. We are technically supposed to lock rooms when we leave them empty throughout the day, but no one ever did. So I just left my door unlocked when I went to get the kids. I would go get a kid in pre-K, so they'd literally be like two classrooms away, less than a minute to pick them up and walk back. My door would be locked by the time I returned. Sometimes I would be gone longer, but sometimes that's all it would take, just 60 seconds. I messed around with the door in my free time, trying to figure out how it was locking. The only conclusion I could come up with was that somebody was manually locking it when I was gone. I asked the janitor, because he was always around, and he said no, he'd never done it. I asked if it could lock itself, and he said no, it's not possible. So I came to the conclusion that somebody was messing with me trying to teach me a lesson for not locking my door or something passive aggressively. Well, I don't play that. So I texted my boss, the vice principal, and I asked her to come talk to me when she had some time. I explained the situation to her and she said that she was sure that nobody would ever do something like that. She also said she would have maintenance look at the door. That was the end of it. I come back after the weekend and the door is broken, like off kilter on the hinges so it won't even shut all the way. I guess locking on its own won't be a problem anymore. The school did have security cameras in the halls. I wonder if they had any video of me pushing the doorknob down to check that it was unlocked before walking off, returning and having it being locked. Anyway, after that, there was a day where I went to get a kid out of his classroom in the pre-K wing by my office, but they switched up the schedule that day so the class wasn't in there. I shrugged it off, went to go pick up the other kid that also sat in there for this block, and then came back. There was another paraprofessional watching her own kids in the playroom nearby, so I asked her if she knew where the other class would be right now. She said she didn't know, but that she thought she had just seen a kid run in there. Maybe they were going in to use the bathroom. I said, okay, and I went back into the empty classroom. I have the other little kid with me at this point. There's a bathroom at the back of the class, but it's open. I walk over there, confused, and check the room. I even look behind the door, and there is no kid. I shrug my shoulders at the other little one and begin walking back toward the exit of the room. 
the bathroom door slams shut behind me. The other little kid jumped out of his skin. I tried to remain calm. The other paraprofessional nearby sees us out in the hallway, peering into the empty classroom, presumably looking very puzzled and a little freaked out. She asks if the kid was in there. I said, no, but the door slammed behind me when I was walking out. I trailed off, looking down at the kiddo with me, who was looking back up at me with his eyes as wide as ever. Probably just the wind, I say. The other para kind of looks at me crazy, but shrugs it off and keeps about her business. The kid I was with, I kid you not, whispers, it was a ghost. And of course, I say, no, no, I'm sure it was just because I messed with the door. You know, the obvious. Incident blows off, a couple of weeks pass by, and I'm in the empty computer room working on art for the walls. It's Wednesday, so it's an early day for pre-K, and all of the littles have gone home, while the real teachers are in a staff meeting. Someone knocks at my office door. Mind you, the door no longer shuts all the way, so I figure they don't want to barge in. I get up from my desk five feet away, and I open the door. Nobody is there. I look down the hallway, and nobody is there. I go sit back down, more annoyed than anything, and it happens again. At this point, I'm kind of fed up. I do practice witchcraft, and I've been doing so seriously for more than 16 years but I have no mediumship abilities or anything like that. I don't deal with ghosts and spirits in my practice, but that's the reason that I'm not scared at this point. I ask the janitor if the place is haunted. Man, this guy doesn't skip a beat. And he says, oh yeah, Rodney? Rodney, yeah, that little boy, he died in there. They named that doll across from the office after him, you know? What the heck? I asked my supervisor to confirm this and she said, oh yeah, no one ever told you about Rodney, huh? I'm like, yeah, well that could have been in your ad. So at this point, I've become acquaintances with the school librarian. I ask her about what's going on. She says all kinds of people have had weird experiences. Night janitors have had things move on their own. One time, the top principal had an alarm go off showing somebody was down in the basement at 3 a.m. But none of the outside doors had gone off and nobody was on video in the school at the time. I guess another time over spring break, the doll across from the office got ripped up in his display case, his head laying on the ground, which is why he has a construction paper on him now. No one on camera and nothing on the camera of the doll. Another staff member never believed in ghosts until she saw a little boy run into a classroom and then promptly disappear. That's about the extent of things that happened to me there, but I became fascinated. Some staff knew of the ghost, some had never heard anything about it. Mostly, staff who worked on my side of the building had experiences. The other side of the building seemed like a whole other world, totally normal, no ghosts over there, I became the weird ghost girl, I'm sure, always asking people if they'd seen anything. I am not the person to pretend like nothing's going on, so as not to stir the pot. No way. Of course, I'd never let the kiddos hear me. No one other than the janitor ever seemed to have heard of anybody dying at the school. But people who had heard of the ghost, or had experiences, did have their theories. One day, I asked a paraprofessional from another school in the district because at a meeting, she mentioned that she herself had attended that elementary school where I worked. She didn't know anything about a ghost, but she did say that while she attended, a boy died at the school, in the wing, where I work. He had the flu and his heart gave out. It's actually a really very sad story that I'll just spare you, but she could corroborate. She said that they hung a drawing of him up in the hallway to commemorate him. Sure enough, among the plaques, there's this framed picture of a swimming hole and a mountain in memory of Ernie, not Rodney. I found a much better job and quit during summer vacation, but I did tell Ernie 
or Rodney or whoever in the silence of the computer room in the last week of school, that if he wanted to, he could cross over, that he didn't have to be stuck at the school. I even had a sacred place out in the country where I believe the veil is thin and that he was welcome to come there with me. Like I said, no psychic abilities here, but I did drive out there on the last day and I put down a birdhouse for Ernie. I really hope that he's doing well.